Okay team, hey tribe, Calvin here again for Wild Wednesdays, episode two, so excited about this. I just wanna say before we jump into any questions, I was really super impressed by questions last week and actually been really appreciative of all of your wishes, all of your messages, all of your comments. Uh, I think everyone's super pumped about it. I know you've been looking for the podcast. We can confirm it's, it's all just got started out. We're gonna be launching that in just a little bit. It's called The Wildcast with Calvin Coyles. I'll let you know more about that uh, and there'll be some more information getting syndicated out, but I'm very excited to kick some goals with you guys as well. So without any further ado, uh, this is where we answer your questions on wellness, income, love, lifestyle, and direction, baby. Let's jump straight into it. What's our first question? Cool. So a huge shout out to all of our contributors this week and everyone that has posted up questions. If you've got a question you want answered, make sure you comment below, DM us on Instagram or email the team. We'll, we'll post all of our contact details in this post. So the first question comes from Jacinda V and is in the area of love. So... Is there a tool or way to strengthen your gut feeling rather than forgetting it's even there and thinking highly of most people you encounter? Is there a, like, is there a problem? With yes. So I'm assuming this is uh, on behalf of Jacinda. I'm hoping I'm interpreting this correctly, but I think that she doesn't trust her intuition or tap into her gut feeling when she meets people. So she's often left hurt because she trusts everyone very easily and isn't really tuning into um, her knowingness or right. her gut feeling. Right. Okay, cool. So uh, look, it's a good question. It's a good question to center because I think everyone has an intuition and that it's like any muscle in the body, it can be strengthened over time. I think the most important thing is that you trust your intuition even when it hurts, right? And so you know, there's a quote which says that experience, sorry, good judgment is a result of experience and experience is a result of bad judgment. So what does that mean for you? Well, it means that in order for you to fine tune your intuition, in order for you to understand if a person's gonna be good for your life or bad for your life, in order to pattern recognize, you know, the narcissist from the people that have genuinely got your best interests in mind, you need to trust your gut and then you need to have that be wrong. And it's about actually you developing this relationship with your intuition so that you can go, okay, this seems like an aha for me, so follow through on it. And then when it doesn't work out, you get the ability to learn from that experience. What most people do is they live in self-doubt. And so they're constantly living with the past, constantly being a reflection of their future. In most cases, the future is well rehearsed past. So they keep repeating the same patterns of behavior. And the, the biggest cause of erosion of your own intuition is self-doubt. So if it feels a yes, go with it. If it feels a no, go with it. It doesn't have to make logical sense. You don't need to justify your behavior to anybody else, but it's about being able to reinforce that. I think it's better to trust everybody and be disappointed than to not trust everybody and be safe. And the reason for that is that you've actually already lost the game by not trusting everybody before you even got started. I would prefer to live my life trusting and loving everybody only to be let down by a few people than to go through my whole life being skeptical, hesitant, and resistant to people in my life and then find actually that I was right in the end. And so I'm a big believer in giving everyone the benefit of the doubt, giving everyone all of that you have, whether that be money, time, energy, or love or trust, always go in with that mentality and then allow uh, for life experience to teach and educate you. And ultimately understand as well that good people can do bad things. Good people in the right conditions can do incredible things, but good people in the wrong conditions, in the wrong state, the wrong time in their lives, under stress and pressure are going to do the wrong things as well. It doesn't have to be a personal attack against you. So um, hopefully that helps. I think the biggest thing is just to trust, is to trust your intuition, trust yourself that you're strong enough to get through anything that might hold you back in life as well, and to remember that you learn lessons mostly from the mistakes that you make as well. And if people are hurting you, then that's actually a really good thing for you long term because it gives you the ability to navigate those behaviors. Mm, love that one. So the next question uh, comes from Anna E and is in the area of lifestyle. I need tips on time management because I'm really struggling to fit everything in. You're welcome to life, Anna E. Uh, I think everyone struggles to fit everything in. You know, life is hectic. There's a million things going on. And so I'll give you a couple of things just off the top, the top of my head. Number one is that if you don't put your priorities in your schedule, somebody else will put their priorities in your schedule, right? It just goes without saying. Time fills the vacuum. And so if you check out your phone, I don't have my phone on me because I'm checking out you guys right now on Facebook. Shout out to everyone on Facebook. But if you check on your phone and you scroll, you swipe to the left, scroll down to time usage, you know, the average person picks up their phone close to 100 times a day, 
day, the average person will use their phone several hours every day. So it's not that we don't have time, it's that we don't have enough structure around our time. So a couple of things for you to keep in mind. Number one, the week starts Sunday night. It doesn't start Monday morning. Start Sunday night by planning out your agenda for the week. Most people don't achieve their results because they try to do too much in too short of a time frame. You're looking for two critical activities every day, and ideally you want to address and identify those in the morning, get them done first thing before the day gets ahead of you. I was speaking to my grandma just the other night, actually. She says, uh, Calvin, uh, two hours on a morning is the equivalent of five hours in the middle of the day. And what she meant by that is, you know, the hours before sunrise, you know, five o'clock, six o'clock, seven o'clock, before people get up and get their day started, are way more valuable than the hours after, say, lunchtime, when the world is happening and things are happening and people want your attention. So, you know, for me, the most productive time can be in that morning, uh, morning moment where you can get more done in less time. So starting your day with the right intensity, having the right morning routine to get your day started as well, and ultimately understanding this. This is a really important point with regards to time management. Time is not our most valuable asset. Energy is. You, know, you can have all the time in the world, but if you're sick and you're bored and you're frustrated and you're overwhelmed and you feel lethargic, lethargic, it's wasted time. You can have a tiny moment, but with tremendous energy, you can break that moment open and dominate and produce tremendous results. So, you know, there's days where I get more done in a day than I did in a month. There's months where I don't get as much done as what I do in a day, and that's the ebbs and flows of life, right? What you want to understand is that it's about making sure that you set up your day for success and you've got to be uh, you know, sophisticated to understand how you naturally operate. I'm a sort of person that is high energy, short period of time, you know, do something intense, and then I need a recovery period. And you know, it looks like on the surface of things that I'm doing things all the time, but in reality, there may be days where I take a lot of rest. There may be days when I'm very productive and energized. We're about to go on a tour where we do um, Melbourne on Friday and Saturday, Sydney Sunday, Monday and Tuesday, Auckland on Wednesday, Wellington on Thursday, Sunshine Coast on Friday, Perth on Saturday. So in the case of one week, I don't know how many cities, countries that is, it's intense. However, when I come back, I'll relax, I'll recharge, we'll take it slow, I'll sleep in, we'll, we'll have recovery time. So it's important that you run your own race. You structure your day for you, not for somebody else. And it's very important to make sure you've got some structure and some organization around that as well. The day doesn't finish until the next day is being planned and your week starts on Sunday night, not Monday. We call it a war room where we sit, we look at our agenda for the week. That's very, very important. Uh, and also setting games and times around things. Pomodoro is 20 minutes of focused energy and activity. You can do some tremendous work as well. Um, and remember, energy is your most important asset, not time. Awesome. So the next one comes from Megan W and is in the area of love. So how can you let go of negative expectations and trauma from a previous relationship and start accepting that you're in a healthy relationship now and don't need to be on high alert all the time? Well, I think, Megan, that if you're asking that question, you're already on the first step towards doing it. You know, I think awareness precedes change. So if you were in a position where you were truly trapped by that old relationship, well, you wouldn't even know that you were truly trapped. At the extreme, you would be just living in, in reaction, right? When you're at least having an awareness of, well, hold on, this relationship's a bit different and I want to open myself up and I want to start to let my guard down, well, that in itself is the first step on that journey. So a good thing is to know that you're already on track to doing that. Um, then in a practical sense, you know, you don't need to burn the boats in a relationship. You also don't need to burn the boats in a business. People say this to me all the time. This metaphor will make sense for your question. People will say, Calvin, you know, I want to leave my job and start a business. And, you know, when do I do that? And I go, well, when your business is already successful, you know, you can transition from one to another. You don't have to put all this pressure on yourself for, you know, to, to let your guard down straight away for the, you jump head first into this new relationship because that itself could be a trigger for your partner in their own life to cause them to pull back, which causes you to be hurt. So if you can say honestly that you're showing up fully every single day for your partner, at whatever stage of relationship you're in, you can't ask any more than that, number one. Number two, it's also important for you to do the inner work. So if you've been hurt in the past, as we all have, right, like love hurts, if you've been hurt in the past, you've got to make sure that you're doing the work to, whether that be you know, uh, creative writing, journaling, meditation, psychotherapy, you're attending one of our events or seminars, doing the work to strip back the layers of meaning. Because nothing in life has meaning except the meaning we give to it. So a breakup can be he or she left me, but it also can be that they gave me space to be myself. It can be that I decided to, like, depending on how you frame that in your own life determines the meaning, and the meaning then determines the emotion attached. 
So you are gonna do the inner work as part of that as well. And if the person that you're working with, that you're loving, that you're spending time with is showing up for you, if they are holding space for you, if they're being a mirror for you, when you're being all 50 shades of crazy that we all can be, if they're being present with you, then I think it's a good indication that they've got the right stuff. And don't listen to what people say, watch what people do. When they say, I'm always here for you, and then when you need them, they're not there, well, then that shows me that they're not really congruent. But if they say, I'm there for you, and then when you need them, they are, then you, you're on the right track. And you know, there is no such thing as a good relationship or a bad relationship. There's bad dynamics, and there's good dynamics. Two people in a terrible dynamic will be a terrible relationship, but they're not terrible people. So you've got to acknowledge behaviors, but you know, love the person and continue to refine and work through your own stuff as part of that to be able to make sure that you're showing up fully for your partner. And in many cases, you might be concerned about you know, how you're showing up and letting your guard down on the same token as well. That also shows in your partner. So if, if you're in a position where you're not fully opening up to your partner, I can promise you they're not going to fully open up to you. And then it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy as well. So be the one that's willing to take the first step towards love. Uh, and to be willing to sort of take your guard and your armor off a little bit as well. And knowing that you can be hurt as part of that, that's part of the game. But you know what? The game was designed to be played and to, to be lived, not to be safe. Uh, I prefer to be hurt, uh, but to really live, than to be safe all the time and not really ever fully you know, taste the experience of what it means to be in love. Beautiful. So moving on to a slightly different area, we've got a question here from Beth B in the area of hey, income. Beth. Income. Show me the money, Beth. <laughs> Do you think a financial crisis is going to happen soon? If so, <laughs> how soon? And what are good ways to make money if it does? Hold on, let me get my, my crystal ball. I can pull this down. Let me get my crystal ball and we'll spin the ball and I'll tell you where the financial crisis is going to be in the earth, right? Like I'm a fortune teller. So here's the thing, right? Um, I think, is there going to be a financial crisis, Beth? Um, yes and no. I think that if you look hard enough, you'll find a financial crisis everywhere in the world right now. If you also look hard enough, you'll find financial abundance and opportunity everywhere in the world right now. In every moment, there is both tremendous pain and tremendous joy. In every moment, there is financial poverty and financial abundance. I think the Chinese have a symbol for crisis, uh, which means uh, opportunity and also danger at the same time. So I want you to understand that if you're trying to get clear on, do you think there's going to be a financial crisis coming? Well, I think it's important to understand what are you looking for, number one? Because every time I see a hard experience or a tough experience, I'm always looking as well for a positive opportunity. I think that there's never been a better time to be alive in human history. I think that in the next years, we will make tens of millions of dollars for ourselves and our clients. I think that people that invest in themselves, that are the best at what they do, that are supporting other people, that are adding massive value to the marketplace will always find ways of making money no matter what happens with the economy. And I'm fortunate that I've developed a talent that is universally accepted and desired, which means that, you know, for me right now, uh, New Zealand is, is, if not the, certainly in the top two or three territories for me globally in the world, and I wasn't doing anything in New Zealand 12 months ago. So if you consider that, you know, Perth right now might be going backwards, there might be a financial crisis in Perth, but we've future-proofed our business, which means I can pick up and go anywhere in the world, i.e. Auckland or Wellington, and I can make money in Auckland and Wellington while Perth's not doing well. So I think it's important to know that, yes, there's always going to be a financial crisis. Don't try to pick the market. Instead, develop something that's incredibly valuable as an asset, i.e. yourself, and you'll be recession-proof, number one. Number two, understand that we live in a global world and everything's all interconnected. So in one area, things are growing. In one area, things are not doing too well. You've got to be able to develop those into um, into border skills that you can go anywhere with what you do for work. And remember this quote by Richard Branson. He was once asked, with regards to his island, Neck Island, which is, I think it's 79,000 US a night. Uh, he said, um, someone asked him, do you have a problem with demand, you know, getting people to come and stay at the island? And the answer was, if you create something that's the best in the world, you'll never have a problem with demand and supply. And so in your case, if you develop something in yourself that's the best in the world, it doesn't matter what happens in terms of a crisis, I think you'll always be incredibly uh, well supported and protected. So um, for whatever it's worth, I don't think there's going to be a crisis. Uh, I think there's always a crisis because people always see what they want to see. And I think if you're prepared, you'll find opportunities in that and you'll capitalize and you'll be tremendously wealthy in the years to come. Nice. 
So moving back over to love, we have a question from Jamie. Hey Jamie. Where can I find a nice, genuine 30 something year old guy who won't ghost, play games, go cold, or is not ready for a relationship that doesn't involve Tinder or bars slash pubs? Well, I think if you're finding somebody that that doesn't involve Tinder slash bars slash pubs, you should not go on Tinder slash bars slash pubs because um, you know proximity is power, and uh, there are certain environments that attract a certain type of person. So you know you've got to start fishing in the right pond, Jamie. That's very important. Um, the next point is, can, how can I find a nice thirty-something guy that? Won't ghost, ghost, play games, go cold, or is not ready for a relationship. Yeah, awesome. So I would also say to you, Jamie, that you want a guy that uh, is going to play games in the right way because games create desire and anticipation and excitement and, and the, the draw card. You just want to be in control of the game. You want to be in a position where the game results in you winning the game, not losing the game. And that's not unfortunately, unfortunately that's just not the way that this game works called a relationship. Uh, I would also get you to get clear on what games are you playing currently with men because it's always a mirror. You know, you're either attracted to guys that play games because you're attracted by that or you're playing games with guys yourself as well. I think there's something to be aware of going, if you become the best version of yourself, you will attract somebody that will be the best version of themselves and there'll be a great union. But for me, I'm very transparent uh, you know, I remember when Ash and I first got together, it was very clear that I don't do this dating thing. I just don't do it. It's like, hey, if we're going to be together, we're going to be together. If we're not being together, we're not being together. I was very transparent and upfront with that as well. Uh, admittedly, in our culture, it's easier for a guy to be upfront than it is for a woman to be upfront. But Jamie, I would be quite honest with your intentions. You know, you've got to look for who it is that you're looking for. So if you're out there and the conversation is, hey, I'm not looking for anything serious right now, well, then that's what you're going to find. But if you're having a narrative and a conversation with people that is, hey, I'm interested in a longer term relationship, you know, some people are going to scare them off. But for me, I remember the first day Ash and I started dating, I took her to Bali. We sat down and when we were at our first dinner together at a place called the Banyan Tree, I got the waitress to bring over a napkin and a pen. And she, I put it on the table and I got uh, Ash, I asked Ash, I said, what do we want to do with the rest of our lives? What does our dream life look like? And on that napkin, on our first date together, we mapped the whole thing out. That was on date one. Now, that's uh, uh, outlandish, very cavalier, uh, very, uh, a, a very different way of approaching dating. But for me, obviously it worked. We're married now. That's a win. Uh, we just celebrated our six-month anniversary yesterday. But the point being is that I was very clear, I was very upfront with what I wanted and what terms I wanted it as well, uh, and I wasn't interested in playing any games. So it takes two people to play a game, and you only have an issue with the game if you get sucked into the game and you try to win the game, and you go, why is he playing a game with me? It's because you decided to play a game as well. So if you don't play the game, and if you identify people that are playing games, oh, look, I'm just not interested in that. If, if you want to play by these rules, we can have this conversation. And if you don't, then we're going to have to find something different. I think that will help you. And ultimately understand that relationships is like sales. Your struggle right now is you're looking for a qualified lead. Part of that is you've got to be able to leverage your lead generation. Tinder's great at that because you can see a lot of people all at the same time. But there's obviously a certain type of person that's on Tinder. And there's been great romances created by Tinder, but you're probably going to get a better quality client if you get a referral from maybe a family or a friend as opposed to going on a dating app or a website. Also, not all dating apps are created equal. Tinder, from and I've never been on Tinder, but from what I have been told about Tinder is that it's, it's a low quality experience than perhaps some of the more sophisticated dating apps that you could potentially look at. So consider what you're investing into the relationship, consider what they're investing into the relationship, and, uh, and consider that you're only, a, you're only losing the game if you're playing the game, and be very clear and upfront with what it is that you're looking for, and then hold space and wait for that person to come across. And um, there's a great Scottish quote that says, if it's meant for you, it'll not go past you. So if, if he is meant for you at this moment in your life right now, he won't go past you. If you just keep showing up and being the best version of yourself, that's a very attractive quality. 100%. I'll also add to that a shameless plug for the wild community where we have a huge amount of people who are all looking to develop long lasting and meaningful relationships and friendships. So it's a good place to start. Yeah, 100%. Come do our courses. I'll be <laughs> single, guys. I'll be a wingman.
Um, this one's also from Jamie. So following on from the previous question, how do you receive a compliment? I don't know what to do when I get one except shut it down or find a reason why it isn't true. I want to be able to genuinely accept a compliment. Okay, then just accept the compliment. Start by being grateful for the compliment. Start by saying thank you for the compliment. Um, and start just sitting in that space of awkwardness. And then if you feel awkward, if you want to try and shut it away, you know, resist that urge. It's like wanting to eat chocolate from the cookie jar, right? You don't get a physique like this, ladies and gentlemen, by just eating snacks whenever you want to, Calvin. So you've got to develop that self-discipline. And if you feel negative emotions or things coming up, then, okay, cool, acknowledge that and get clear on why that's the case. Do the inner work as part of that as well so you can accept it. But ultimately, one, get more of them. Two, uh, start complimenting other people as well because generosity, it's a good vibration to have. Um, and, uh, and stop fighting it. Instead, ask for it and, uh, and just receive it. Beautiful. Moving on to a wellness related question. We've got Ben M who hey says, ben. I'm doing my best at the moment to focus on my health and fitness, but my downfall is social pressure and guilt. How can I say no to food or drinking in a diplomatic way? I.e. to my grandma when she offers me brownies. Oh, wow, Ben. So grandmas are tough. Grandmas are tough. Um, so here's the thing. Peer pressure is real. You've got to use peer pressure to your advantage. So one of the things that we talk about quite a lot in our programs and seminars and courses is that proximity equals power. And I'll give you an example of how powerful this is. We were in Brisbane a couple of months back, and I always remember this. I don't know why it sticks on my mind, but it does. So we're in Brisbane, and uh, as we're pulling into the Brisbane airport, we're filling up our hire car, so we go to the service station. And um, as I'm coming out of the service station, uh, we filled up the car, it's all good. As I'm coming out of the service station, I see these guys drive past me in a ute. It's a twin dual cab ute, so the guys in the front, guys in the back, and there's three people in the car. All of them are in high vis, they're obviously going to a mine site. And um, the guys, the two guys in the front have got Red Bulls and Vs and pies, and the guy in the back's got another Red Bull and a sausage roll. And this is probably about 10 a.m. in the morning, right? So it's super early and the boys are getting their day started. And it just, they fit the perfect stereotype of guys that worked on a, on a, on a site. Hard, bigger guys, right? And I just thought, wow, imagine if you're the third guy in the car. Imagine if you're the guy in the car and you're trying to go on a health kick and you're, you're trying to eat healthy and here you have, um, you, you got your two best mates in the car and you guys are about to drive three or four hours to the mine site and uh, you're all dressed the same, look the same, act the same, talk the same, and you're sitting in the back with sparkling mineral water or, or an iced tea and, uh, and a salad, and they've got sausage rolls and pies and, and Red Bull. Now, even nothing else, then even if they were supportive of you, like, mate, so proud of you, well done, the simple temptation and the smells in that cabin would be torture for the next couple hours, right? So this is not an easy thing. And families, in many ways, associate food to providing, particularly women do this, where and, 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 and a lot of dads as well, particularly single dads, where it's like, I, I make food for you as a way of showing you my love. So when you come to my house and you don't eat that food, then therefore what that also means in my world is that you don't love me, right? Which I know sounds ridiculous, but at some level in our cultural structure, that's been embedded. That's why families have dinner together rather than they're just being food and everyone eats on their own. There's something about that community and that bonding. So here's what's important. Number one, you have got to be aggressively committed to your goals with regards to health and wellness. Not just because of the family peer pressure, but because of the marketing, the consistency, the radio ads, the, the text messages, all the stuff that goes into marketing. I mean, Domino's, I reckon, sends me a text message every day, if not twice a day, right? You drive past and you know, KFC and McDonald's will play ads on the radio around mealtimes because they know that people are listening to them and you're likely to be hungry, right? You know, there's, there's also, I could, I could go into the whole science around how our brains are designed when we see or smell food to have a rush of what's called dopamine, the achievement chemical inside of our brains, which makes us feel good, which makes us want to eat because it becomes an addictive tendency because there were times when we literally couldn't eat and we would starve to death. So you are fighting a losing battle when you try to diet, when you try to be consistent with your food, uh, even the more moderate versions of those things are very difficult to do long term without tremendous tremendous willpower and discipline. How do you have that? One, you've got to have real clarity on the goal that you want. You've got to really have absolute clarity on what you want your body to look like, your health to look like, and why you're doing it. And you've got to develop a compelling vision and some real leverage on yourself to make that happen. Number two, you've got to be upfront and have strong boundaries of the people that you love and understand that you're going to experience some friction and criticism. 
you know, when Ash and I go to our family's house, they've learned now because it's taken time, but they've learned now to go, hey, are you doing a diet or a health program? But they ask us before we come over, so they will then change the food that they offer for us. There's times where we'll go to family dinner because we want to socialize with our family, but we'll bring our own meal to family dinner that better suits the outcomes that we're looking to, to eat towards. And here's what I found. Families will test and test and test and test to try and find weakness because they just want you to be comfortable. They want you to feel loved. Those things don't necessarily always relate though you have the body and the health of your dreams. So if you're absolutely clear and congruent in your own life, if there's no doubt in your mind that this is what I'm eating, this is why I'm eating it, this is what I'm doing it for, then that congruency will come across to your family and they'll accept that. Uh, and if they don't, then that's okay. You just go, okay, no problems. I appreciate it. I'm not going to eat that right now, but thank you so much for offering it. And you're doing it from a beautiful place of love. Uh, but if you are trying to enable people, they'll enable you and you'll find yourself constantly being in a difficult position. So one, have real clarity on what you want. Two, make sure you've got tremendous personal leverage that you really have clarity and you're fully committed and congruent because even the smallest amount of incongruency will come across and people will, will identify that with you. And then number three, communicate quite clearly your boundaries uh, with regards to what you're doing and why you're doing it and ask people for support. If it comes from a place of support, hey, uh, nana, grandma, gran, mom, dad, I've got this program I'm working towards. This is what I want to accomplish, achieve. I really need your help. And how you can help me is by helping with, with this, st this stuff. Um, that would mean the world to me. Can I have your support? then you're enrolling people, you're not fighting with people with regards to your, your health and fitness. Awesome. Next one comes from Simon B in the area of direction. How can I get out of my comfort zone and leave a job that I've been in for a very long time? Well, I think the question is, why do you want to leave the job you've been in for a very long time? Because in order to do anything worthwhile in life, you need a compelling vision. Now, leaving the job that you're in for a very long time doesn't have to be a bad thing. In fact, it could be the definition of self-sabotage because if your job is good and you're getting paid well and you've got a great team of people around you uh, and you're just bored because you don't have anything else going on in your life, that's not a good reason to leave your job, right? On the flip side, if you're in a job that you hate, you don't like, you don't respect your boss and it's a negative environment, it's probably a good time for you to leave. So we've got to get clear on why it is that you want to leave because leaving a job for the sake of leaving a job is a stupid idea, number one. Number two, following on from that idea, when you have clarity on what it is that you want, uh, that will give, give you the courage to then be able to move forward. And if it's a compelling enough vision moving forward, then you'll naturally put in place that structure. And then what I would do is I would make sure that you go into and find the new job that you want before you leave the current job you've got. You know, go and, and have some interviews with people to find out what's out there. Uh, have some conversations, have some meetings, and if you get a job that's lined up, then you'll make that transition as part of your plan. I would encourage you just to leave the job that you're in right now and then have a period of, of, um, of unemployment, partly because people want to hire people that are already hired. They don't want to hire people that are looking for jobs. Right? It's like people want to date people that are unavailable because it gives them the sense of, oh, I can't have what I want. Right? People always want those things. People that are coming across as desperate and needy, you know, that traditionally there's not a great energy as part of that power play. So my encouragement to you would be put in place a transition plan, start to identify, uh, identify some jobs, and then it's a pretty simple conversation. If you can get paid more money doing more of the work you love, well, it's a pretty easy way to transition. Awesome. Moving on to a question from Christy S in the area of income. Now this one's in two separate parts. So the first part is how can I become better aware of what my money story is that I learned from a young age? That's a great question. And I'm just going to give a shout out to the people that are watching us on, on Facebook, Bo, Nick, Michael, Eleanor, Christy, Hannah, Kate, Byron, Anna. Hey peeps. Thank you so much for joining us on our, on our Facebook live. Um, so how can I identify more of the money story that I've got? Here's a really powerful exercise I would get you to do. I would get you to take a hundred dollar bill in your currency. Uh, and if you're in, in Bali, it's probably a hundred thousand, right? But take a hundred dollar bill or a 50. And I would get you to sit, and this is, this is going to sound a bit woo woo, but I promise you it's very, very powerful and gives us some of the biggest insights that I've ever seen for a simple activity and it's free to do, right? So what I want you to do is I want you to sit on a chair and in front of you I want to have the the um, the, the note on, on another chair in front of you and I want you to imagine that you're having a conversation with money and just write down some questions that go through this little bit with you because it'll make sense if money reminded you of somebody that you know 
yourself, loved one, friend, or a family member, past, present, or future, who does money remind you of? You know, just trust your gut here, whatever comes to mind. If money could say something to you now, what would money say to you now? If money had a lesson for you that you haven't yet learned, what would money's lesson for you be? If money, um, if you had hurt money, what have you done or said about money in the past? How have you treated money in the past that's caused money to leave you? On the flip side, what's your relationship with money? What do you feel like, how do you feel money supported you and how do you feel like money's let you down? So you can have this dynamic conversation. I want you to imagine if you could sit down and interview uh, all of the wealthy men and women in the world and ask them questions or if you could sit down and think about money as a person not as as an instrument of value but as you could imagine money as a person and you would ask those people ask money those questions all the questions you've ever wanted to ask about money deep personal questions about money write a list of 10 to 15 20 30 questions and then I want you to sit in your own space completely free of distractions this is a very sacred process but sit down and have that conversation. It's important to have two physical chairs and have money literally sitting on the chair in front of you and have these conversations and just notice what are some of the answers that you get intuitively that come back to you? What are some of the answers that intuitively come back? And I promise you, if you treat this exercise with the care and attention that it deserves, it will be transformative for you and will allow you to dramatically shift your relationship with money. Then what I would encourage you to do is first and foremost sit where you are, have the conversation with money. Then I would encourage you to then sit on top of the bill, right? Sit on top of the bill and have a conversation back as money, assume the consciousness of money and have the conversation back with yourself. Now, if I've still got you here and you haven't completely rejected this as woo woo, right? I want you to understand how powerful this process can be to have that narrative. And that's a conversation that you can have again and again and again. You know, see, the thing is, most of us have a negative relationship with money in the way that we talk about it, work with it, treat it, spend it, use it, and earn it. The language that we use around money is very toxic. If you were to speak about a loved one with that same language, it would be an incredibly painful relationship. And yet we expect money now to somehow show up in our lives. And so um, I think it's valuable to understand what is the story you've already been telling yourself. And that's a very powerful exercise for you to begin that journey. And I would do that literally every day for the next 30 days and, uh, and see if you can work through some of the pain with regards to that. And just notice how money starts to shift and change for you when you start to change the way you think about, talk about, act about, and earn uh, money. I think that's a great starting point. So you've touched on this briefly, but just in case you wanted to add anything else to part two of Christy's question, how can the money story have an effect on your approach and thoughts towards money now? Yeah, I think that's a natural flow on. So I would do that conversation. Let's say you do that conversation on a morning. I'd have that meditation, that guided meditation around money on a morning. And I'd sit and have that dialogue. And then I would see what comes up for me. And then I would try to implement the lessons of that in the day ahead. And notice that all lessons only occur in the friction between idea and reality. So it's only when we're trying to implement that principle that we can actually experience some friction. So I would, uh, I would do that. And then I would also experiment with this idea and concept as well, which is to take an amount of money and I would, uh, I would imagine myself in the day spending that money. So let's say you start with 100 bucks. Start with $100 today and spend that money in your mind, hypothetically spend that money. We're going around the shops, online shopping, whatever it might be, not really, hypothetically, okay? Hypothetically, spend the money. Then tomorrow, $200. Then the next day, $400. Then the next day, $800. Then $1,600. Then $3,200, etc. Every day, 30 days, double it. Now, I don't know how much it becomes by the time it gets to um, day 30, but I imagine it will be you know, over the hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars. It'll be actually over millions of dollars by the 30th day. Um, and it's a great exercise in practicing shifting your relationship with money by getting used to spending money in your mind uh, with bigger amounts. The rules are you can't buy something you bought the day before and you can't just buy multiple of the same thing. So you have to fully spend uh, the amount of money in that particular day. That's a good exercise for you, for you to practice. Cool. Moving on to the next question from Amy T in the area of lifestyle. How do I deal with bullies in my workplace? This is a really important one. I think it's the same answer for bullies in the workplace, bullies in the schoolyard, bullies in life in general. So here's the thing. Uh, a bully, if you, if you strip it back, you remove the label, you've got someone that is in a position of power 
exerting dominance over somebody that is in a relative lack of that power. And oftentimes it can be when someone perceives themselves to be in a dominant position and they're trying to dominate. All the bullying is, it's trying to dominate somebody else. Now, I want you to understand the reason why that happens is because someone is lacking power in their own life. And the easiest way for me to feel like I'm in control and that I'm powerful, the easiest way for me to do that is to become physically or verbally or emotionally violent towards somebody else. If I'm not in a position of dominance in my own life, the easiest way for me to feel like I am is to be dominant over somebody else because that, that shifts the energy and focus onto you and it makes me feel good. That's the only reason why bullying happens is because someone is self-vulnerable. They're vulnerable about their own emotional state. They don't feel good enough, strong enough, capable enough. And this, by the way, might be unconscious, but they are attempting to dominate somebody else to make themselves feel better about that process. That's the only real reason why it happens. That itself, by the way, can help you shift the frame. So when someone's bullying you at work, if you can genuinely see it from a deep place of insecurity that they have got something going on in their life, consciously or subconsciously, where they feel vulnerable, where they feel scared, where they feel out of control or powerless, uh, and that can be quite a toxic experience, when you feel like that and they're trying to create that dominance over you, what they're really doing is they're trying to ask for help. So if you can come at this from a different place where you meet them with love and you meet them with tolerance and understanding and acceptance and the, and the sort of uh, you know, olive branch of friendship, so to speak, and you say, hey, I just want you to know over the last couple of days, weeks or months, I felt like we've had quite a toxic relationship. And... I've been feeling as though, you know, the way that we've been communicating hasn't been positive. And I, I don't know what's going on for you, but I just wanted to say, hey, I'm here for you if you need anything. Then what that does is that puts you back in the box seat of position of power and it allows you to control the narrative of the conversation and it allows you to maybe approach this person who's actually hurting from that place rather than fighting fire with fire. So that would be one way of approaching the conversation. That is not always going to work. Because if someone is deliberately hell-bent on just making your life a misery, well, then you've only got several options on the back end of that. So here's something, you know, I'm, I don't ever get bullied. Uh, and the reason why is because I'm a very strong, confident, dominant person. So I want you to understand that you don't get in life what you deserve. You get in life what you tolerate. And if you are feeling insecure or self-conscious or, or a lack of, lacking self-confidence, then you need to reinforce and strengthen your own physical uh, uh, conditioning, not only physically, but emotionally and spiritually. So as a result of that, there is no need to prey on me because I am no longer weak. And I no longer have a perception of weakness. So for me, I will be strengthening my own self-character. I'd be getting into the gym and I'd be lifting weights. For no other reason than you're going to feel stronger as part of that. You're going to connect with your physical body. I'd be writing a hundred list of the hundred things that I'm excellent in to build my self-confidence. I'd be having great conversations with positive people about my career and where I'm going with my life to build that self-confidence. I'd be learning and reading books and investing in myself to build that network and community around me. Uh, I'd be doing as much as I possibly can to strengthen who I am as a person because a strong person, you know, it's like you know, our line doesn't listen to the opinions of sheep, right? So, you know, at the moment though, if you're a baby sheep, you are listening to the opinion of sheep. You want to position yourself as a lion. You can develop that as well and you can strengthen your own resolve. That's something that I would definitely be looking at you doing. I'd be having a very open, honest conversation about your expectations of this person or these people and saying, hey, I want you to know that this is the way that it's your communication is making me feel. I don't want that as part of my life anymore, so I'm gonna just request you to stop doing that. Most people dilly-dally around circumstances as opposed to identifying a problem and speaking to someone that can do something about it. So that's the person you're in conflict with. Have an open, honest conversation. Most of the time, it's just miscommunication. But you've got to be very clear about this is what I will tolerate and this is what I won't tolerate. And then if it's in a position where if you can't change somebody else, which most of us can't, you've got to change yourself. You've got to change and take away any of the hold that that has on you. And here's the most simplest example I can give you. If you had someone at work that you really admired and respected that came up to you and said that you're worthless and you'll never amount to anything, that's probably going to affect you in a pretty negative way. However, if a kid on the street that is chucking a, a, a toddler um, um, a temper tantrum on the street, says you're worthless and you'll never amount to anything, you probably look at the kid like, who are you and why did you say that to me? But you'd probably laugh at the kid if they're having a, a tantrum. The reality is that it's still the same words, but when it's said in a different context from a different person, it means very different things. 
And so you've got to shift the label and the meaning that you put on to things in your life so that you know, people that communicate with you, no one can ever, ever, ever control how you respond to life. Life is 10% what happens and 90% what you choose to do about it. So if you don't like what they're doing, you can't change what they're saying, right? But you can change how it makes you feel. And hopefully there's some tactics in what I've just shared with you that will help you do that as well. Um, but clear, honest, concise, direct communication I've always found to be effective. And if it's not effective, at least you know exactly where you stand. And then if it's within the workplace, obviously there are, are remedies, both your management, um, and leadership teams that can handle that as well um, and potentially change uh, divisions or departments or uh, uh, play a different game. I'm not going to give you the aggressive answer, but there's other ways of, of, of dealing with the circumstance and the situation by uh, you know, playing a different game than, than perhaps the one you're playing in the office. Awesome. So we've just got a couple of questions left, two to be precise. So we've got a question here from Matt R in the area of direction. I don't have anything I'm passionate about. So how do I find my direction if there's nothing that excites me? So Matt R, that's bullshit. Uh, everyone has things that they're passionate about. Uh, maybe you've lost that loving feeling, I don't know. But I would say to you that saying that you don't have things that you're passionate, passionate about is a cop out, right? If you say I don't have anything in my life that you're passionate about, that's the fastest way for you not to be passionate about anything in your life. Instead, if I was to ask you that if you had to find something in your life that you're passionate about, or maybe you were passionate about something as a kid, what would that be? Then you know, identify those things and start doing more of those things that you enjoy. Life is full spectrum, right? you got things on one spectrum that you absolutely hate and things on the other spectrum that you absolutely love. Do more of the shit that's towards the spectrum of things that you love and you'll find that you'll find more things that you love, which means you'll do more things that you love, which means you'll spend more time doing that, which means you'll feel better about yourself and therefore you'll find more things that you love. It's really that simple. Um, so number one, change the language around that there's nothing in your life that I'm passionate about. There's heaps of things, right? It's just maybe you don't think it's that convenient to do those things. I don't know. I don't know your circumstance. And maybe if you're being beaten down by life a little bit and you have lost a bit of that fire and spark, you've got to go back to the time when you had it and start to rekindle some of the flames as part of that by doing more of the things that made you feel alive in the beginning. Um, and, and in many ways, passion can be easily accessed through anger. So, you know, as a vehicle to get you there, if you're fed up and frustrated by your life, at least you've got a bit of gumption to try and do things and change things around. And the real secret to happiness, by the way, which is not quite passion, but it's the secret to happiness which will get you on that journey is progress. If you feel like you're making progress in your life and you're heading towards the things that you want, I promise you're going to feel pretty good about your life. You're going to feel passionate about your life. And that's going to make you feel pretty positive. If you're not doing anything in your life, then you're not going to feel very passionate about anything because you're not actually doing anything to sort of activate and energize that passion as well cool and final question for today's wild wednesdays comes from pete and is uh wellness mindset related so how can i remove self-doubt and break the cycle of negative thinking that i have you're never going to get rid of self-doubt self-doubt is there as a tool as a resource to make sure you consider the downsides that's number one the most successful people on the planet have self-doubt they just don't listen to it that's very important. It's also nice to doubt yourself. It's nice to see how far you can go. There's areas of my life that I don't think are possible. I think that's an excellent place to begin my journey. So that's number one. Number two, what was the second part uh, of the Break the cycle of negative thinking. Negative thinking again. You know, you, the, the negative thinking exists as a way of filling the vacuum and the void in your life. If you're not constantly feeding your mind positivity and energy and motivation, that negativity will creep in. The best example of that being Muhammad Ali. Most of you probably don't know this, but Muhammad Ali's rhetoric of I am the greatest, float like a butterfly, sting like a bee, your hands can't hit what your eyes can't see. This stuff he used to use and he used to speak out loud as a way to quash and suffer the negative voices that were inside of his head. Uh, also as well, we want to learn how to use those voices, not let the voices use you. Uh, for me, I know that if, for example, if I'm playing squash or I'm playing a competitive game, Jace will tell you that when we play squash, if I mess up a hand or if I mess up a serve or I mess up a point, I'll tell myself that that was stupid, that was weak, that wasn't good enough, raise your game, etc. I'll be quite aggressive and I'll say that to myself out loud, never mind what I'm saying in my own head. I'm using that as a way of that negative pain point of refocusing and orienting myself on the prize. You can use that very effectively to your advantage. It's a tool to be used, like self-doubt is. Self-doubt is a powerful tool. 
So use those tools by commanding and controlling them and, and, and dancing with them as well. Rather than constantly fighting them, I don't fight with them, I command them, I use them to my advantage to allow me to be focused on what I need to do. Uh, and, and, and the more comfortable you are with that, the better it is. I want you to understand that your mind is not the truth. You, know, you think thousands and thousands of thoughts every day. Many of them are just reactions to the environment around you. In no way, shape, or form are they a reflection of you, your reality, or even the truth of who you think you are. So if you understand that, you, you'll find a bit more peace with that. And, um, and most people think the biggest problem they have is that they're not meant to have problems. You're always going to have problems. You're always going to have some negative thinking. You're always going to have some self-doubt. But you've got to build that mojo. You've got to build that, um, that, that self-esteem and ultimately understand you can't think about two things at the same time. So if you're thinking about something positive, you can't think about something negative, which is why Muhammad Ali's strategy worked so well. So you've got to start feeding the positivity as part of your mind as well. Robin Sharma would say you've got to stand in the garden. Uh, you've got to guard the, the gate of your mind. You've got to uh, make sure there is no weeds planted in your mind. You've got to make sure you, you, you're cultivating that as part of your everyday practice. So hopefully that adds a bit of value for you as well. Cool, that was the last question. Fantastic. Just want to say thank you to everybody that watched us for another episode of Wild Wednesday. Um, until we see you next week, we're going to be on the road. We'll be heading uh, over uh, next Wednesday. We'll either be filming from Sydney uh, or Auckland when we're on the road. So can't wait to see you for the next episode of Wild Wednesday. Uh, so much good stuff happening. If you're coming to see us on tour, we'd love to see that as well. But ultimately, by the time you see that, we'll probably be back anyway. But uh, until I see you live or online, be bold, have fun, make an impact and I will see you on the wild side.